Hello and welcome to one of our favorite programs, I'd Like to Know. This is our question and answer Bible program where we have the privilege and pleasure of answering your Bible-based questions. I'm C.A. Murray and I'm in the company of my uh, colleague in ministry, Pastor Daniel Miranda. Daniel, good to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here, Pastor C.A. We, we brought in our um, impressive list of questions that is getting longer uh, weekly, and we like that. It shows, one, that you are watching, two, that you are getting the answers that you need and desire, and three, uh, it gives us a chance to go into the Word of God. So we thank you for that because this is, this is great fun to answer questions from the Word. We've got a few questions today. Uh, we, we, we make you this promise, and we state it always at the head of each program. We want to answer you from the Word of God. It's, it's really too late in the history of mankind. We are too close to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to be spewing out, as it were, the opinions of men. Mm. You ask for answers from God's Word. Your questions are based on God's Word. And of course, our answers ought also to be based on God's Word. So we make you that promise that when a question is asked, it will be answered from the Word of God. If an answer can be found, we will try to find it or we will find someone who can. Uh, and that is our privilege and our pleasure. Pastor, if you would begin with prayer, we will dive right into this impressive list of questions. But before you do that, let me, let me just say this. Should you want to be a part of this program, never want to forget to allow the opportunity to send in your own questions to tv at sumtv.org. That is tv at s-u-m as in Mary, tv.org. And we will add your questions to our list and promise you that we will get to them uh, ere we can. Pastor, now if you would pray for us. Yeah, let's pray. <clears throat> Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed ministry and for this wonderful program. Thank you for those who are participating and sending their questions. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit may lead us and guide us into your word. As Pastor C.A. said, we only want to stick to your word and not to present human opinions. I pray, Lord, that this program may help answer the questions that have been sent. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 And amen. Um, this question comes to us from Dr. Gatlauk Jock, MD. <clears throat> he wishes us best regards, and it's, he's got a fairly lengthy preamble, but then he gets right to the question. And may we ask, and, and of course this is not prerequisite, but perhaps if you are writing from outside the country, let us know where you are writing from. Mm -hmm. It gives us some idea of the reach of the ministry, the footprint, as it were, lets us know who is watching from what country, from where in the world. We get questions from all over the world. But uh, if it's not too much of an imposition, if you could add that little bit of information, we would certainly find that helpful uh, for a number of things and metrics that we are trying to establish as we, we try to do what we can uh, to answer questions from around the world. Um, I have a question. First, let me tell you about my understanding of the issue as an SDA. Um, he's got a whole paragraph here, so perhaps we won't, we won't get into that, but get right to his question because he says in Isaiah chapter 65, 20, and we will read that, it seems like there is going to be death or curse while in the new earth. Those things will never be present according to Revelation 21, 3 and 4 and Revelation 22, 3, and in Isaiah 65, 20. But the Bible seems to explain this in context of a new earth. So what is your thoughts on this as theologians? Well, I don't know about theologians, but we are Bible students. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dan, you want to take a little, uh, uh, run at this and, and uh, uh, Dr. Gatlock's question? Yeah, sure. Um, I think you also have good points, but first of all, we need, when we study books like the book of Isaiah and the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, those books fall into the category that some scholars call the classical prophecies. What is a classical prophecy? A classical prophecy is a prophecy that is conditional, that was, when it was first given, it was given to literal Israel 
and it was expected to have a little fulfillment, little mm -hmm. local fulfillment, okay? So you have many things in the book of Isaiah that point to the immediate, or let us not say the immediate, but the local and literal condition of the people. Now, from chapter, the last chapters of the book of Isaiah, this is the last section, those are prophecies that apply directly to the post-exilic community of Israel, those who had returned from Babylon mm -hmm. after their captivity. And God renews the covenant with them, and He promises them to set them as the light of the world and as a great nation, even to the point of lengthening their days. Yes. So it is true that this kind of prophecies, classical prophecies, uh, they also have dual fulfillment. And we have uh, the book of Revelation that borrows a lot of language from this particular passage. For example, in Isaiah 65, verse 17, it says, For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. So this is the context of, of, of verse 20, and this is very almost verbatim uh, passage from Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. But it is true, and the Bible is not inconsistent, that there won't be death or curse in the new heavens and the new earth. So we need to understand this text as a conditional prophecy that could have been fulfilled with literal Israel if they had been faithful to the covenant. Mm -hmm. Because even the covenant had specifications about uh, dietary laws and, and health laws. So it would have even lengthened their day and mm -hmm. their span of life so that even kids would, know, would not die very young. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the way I understand it. Yes, uh, 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 well said. I think when we're dealing with, with, with these prophets, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, to a lesser extent Ezekiel, there is a, an, a sequence mm -hmm. to uh, applying the prophecy. Some, the primary sequence is applied to literal Israel right. at the time the prophecy was, was written yeah. or was enunciated. Then there is a secondary application, a parallel application that can be applied to the prophecy uh, at the end of time. Mm. But the secondary application does not include every nuance of right. the prophecy. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you get into the weeds, as they say, of the prophecy, that's the primary application. But there are certainly secondary parallels mm -hmm. to almost everything that Isaiah said. And of course, once you get past uh, 55 up to the end, you're dealing with post-exilic prophecies. You're dealing mm -hmm. with looking at the, the coming of Christ and those kinds of things. And so this can be looked at in that way. And then I found something else uh, interesting in uh, some notes that I had on the, my Tanakh, which is a Hebrew Bible, mm. that says that these prophecies, uh, uh, in these prophecies, the word will is almost equivalent to the word would. Mm -hmm. So that when you're making that secondary application, uh, a, a child would die. If a child did die or would die at that age, you would consider curse. So the, the burden of the prophecy is this, that uh, God is going to restore Israel and then God is going to restore the world when he comes again. Mm. And so uh, those things that deal with long life and health and the banishment of sin will be replied, will, can be applied to Israel once they've gone through their exile and can be applied to the world just prior to the coming of Christ and looking at the, the establishment of God's kingdom, those things are parallel and mm. are true. Yeah, very good. You know, I, I was just thinking as you were talking about a good example that illustrates this and is found in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39 that has caused quite a bit of confusion among some Christians about the prophecies of Gog and Magog, mm. that they try mm. to apply to literal, uh, for example, to today or even Russia and uh, countries like that. But again, Revelation echoes Gog and Magog yeah. in Revelation chapter 20. But as you said, the, the, the second fulfillment, or we, we would say the second layer yes. of this prophecy doesn't mm -hmm 
get all the details yes. of the first layer. So for example, here we find um, in verse 9 of Ezekiel 39, then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set in fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and bucklers, the bows and arrows, the javelins and spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. Um, we know that this is not talking about that uh, Armageddon is going to last seven years. Seven years. Uh, this, is, is, this could have been fulfilled literally if Israel had fulfilled the conditions in chapter 36 of the New Covenant. Yes. Uh, they would awaken the wrath of this king, Gog, uh, in the land of Magog, but that never was fulfilled. Now, so Revelation takes or picks some aspects of this and applies it to the end, yes. but not with all the specifications about the weapons they were going to use and the time of war, none of those things. Yeah. The, the, of all the books in the New Testament, Revelation draws from about 65% mm. Old Testament works, but it draws them to, to create parallels yeah. and to elaborate on them and to show us that there are parallels with, with the Old Testament times and what, what the way God acted with his people in Old Testament time. But if you try to link up, as you well said, every particular point, mm. it wasn't designed to do that. Exactly. It wasn't intended to do that, and they won't line up particularly. But if you look at the broad scope, the broad arc of, of Revelation, you can see parallels with the Old Testament time. Mm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Alrighty. Very good. Uh, you've got the second one. Sure. The second question comes from Jothan Masilla, and he greets us from Kenya. Greetings to you, my brother. And it says here, here is my question. In Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25, Paul says that he's sold under sin. He says that he's willing to do good in his mind, but he finds another law that is against his will. So he's basically commenting on Romans chapter 7 about the, the, the struggle that Paul was going through. And then this is his question. <clears throat> In verse 24, he cries, laments because of his weakness. In verse 25, he thanks God for the deliverance. But now he says, so then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with flesh the law of sin. What does it mean by that? What does he mean by that? How does he serve the law, the law of God and the law of sin simultaneously? Please Help. I think his question then is based on verse 25 of Romans chapter 7. Mm -hmm. So I think we should read the verse first and then try to explain it. Romans chapter 7 verse 25, it says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a good question, and it is an interesting one drawn from Romans chapter 7. What I see here is this. Paul, in his letter to uh, the Christians at Rome, is articulating mm -hmm. his struggle with sin. Right. And the whole letter, at least this portion of the letter, must be seen in that context. He starts out this chapter, I'm in mean 7-1, with this statement, Or do you not know, don't you know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. So that's the reality that we're dealing with, mm -hmm. the dominion of the law as long as he lives. Now, that puts flight to those who say that once you come to Christ, you have nothing to do with the law right. anymore. Uh, so this, he starts out by telling you mm -hmm. the law has dominion over you as long as you live. Mm -hmm. All right? Then in what I think are three key verses, he orchestrates his struggle to serve the Lord, to fight with sin in the context of the law defining for him what sin is. Mm -hmm. So we look at, at 7, 12, and 14. And there are other texts too, but I, I, I think these tend to stand out for me. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. So he establishes the law for me defines sin. Mm. It is not sin 
but it defines what's in it. Correct. All right. And verse 12. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Amen. He's saying the law is not sin. It is to the contrast of sin or to the contrary, the law is holy, the law is just, the law is good. Mm. And verse 14. <clears throat> For we know that the law is spiritual. And this is the crux of his argument. But I am carnal, sold under, under sin. Mm. Then he, he talks about the struggle. Things I want to do, I don't do. Things I know I shouldn't do, I do do. But it's a consequence of the fact that the law is spiritual. Mm -hmm. I am not. I am carnal. I'm trying to be spiritual. And the law aids me in that, in that it, it creates the boundaries for Christian life. It tells me when I'm sinning. It tells me when I'm slipping. It tells me when I'm going off the tracks, as it were. The law defines for me sin. So if there was no law, he's basically saying there would be no sin. There would be no knowledge of what sin is because, because sin is defined by the law. And he is saying, the law is good, I am not. That is the basis of my struggle. Very good, very good point. <clears throat> I see here in Romans chapter 7, <clears throat> an illustration of someone who knows the law but doesn't have the power from God to obey the law. Mm. Um, here in verse 9, Paul says, I was alive once without the law. That means he didn't have the knowledge of the law. Mm -hmm. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Mm. Now, now, this is a man that he rejoices in the law of God. He wants to do the will of God. But he finds another law in his members, the law of sin, which is sin itself, the transgression of the law that fights against the spiritual law. Yes. And he concludes his argument by saying, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. In what sense is he serving the law of God? Because the person here, uh, the, the key word I believe is, is he serving the law of God and the law of sin simultaneously? Well, God says, or Jesus himself said, that we cannot serve two masters. So there is no such a thing that we serve sin and we serve God simultaneously. We mm -hmm. cannot serve two masters. Mm -hmm. But when it says here, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, is referring to his innermost desire yes. to do the will of God. I mean, in his mind, he was willing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to do it um, because as you mentioned for example verse 19 for the good that I will to do I do not but the evil I will not to do that I practice mm -hmm. so with his mind he is wanting to do the will of God but he finds himself being under the flesh so when he thanks God he is not thanking God because he's serving the law of God and, and the flesh at the same time. Now, he's thanking God for what he is going to mention in the next chapter. Yes. So there is like a parenthetical uh, statement. He's kind of thanking God in advance because now he's going to show uh, what the man, what, what the experience is like about walking in the spirit as mm -hmm. we find in chapter 8. Mm -hmm. I'm glad, so very glad you went to chapter 8. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I was going to uh, oh. uh, respond to you from chapter 8. Good. Be, be, because chapter 8, verse 1. Mm -hmm. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So that's the basis that's for the everything basis. else that follows. Exactly. So I jump down to, let's go to verse 6. For, the, for, um, to, be for to be kindly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So those who are in the flesh cannot mm. please God. And when I was reading, my mind jumped, uh, my, my, my eye jumped back to, to verse 5 and 6 also. But he's, he's giving you the point that the, the carnal mind can't be subject to. The, it, it is not. So the, the, the tension here mm. is between the flesh and the spirit. Exactly. And uh, he's saying, I'm subject to that tension. 
Uh, but he also gives you, and the reason it seems almost schizophrenic is because he gives you glimpses of victory. Mm -hmm. He tells you of his struggle, but he doesn't leave you in mm -hmm. that. He tells you, you know, Man. there is victory here. Man. Uh, there is victory here through the law because the law is holy and just and good. And when I submit myself to the law, then I, I, am, uh, I am in that state with God. So he starts out the next chapter, there is now therefore no condemnation to those are in Christ Jesus. Mm. So rather than leave you in the hole the of, of, of doubt, he starts this next chapter with a little bit of hope. Amen. He goes back to the struggle, mm. but it lets you know there is hope uh, if you're in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise yeah. the Lord. I, I love that answer. Yes, so there is hope, and chapter 8 of Romans tells us clearly that there is no such a thing of serving the flesh and serving the Spirit at the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in us, then we can crucify the flesh yes. and uh, walk in the spirit. Yes. There is a subtext that you just mentioned, Daniel, that I want to just highlight before we leave this. The idea that you cannot serve two masters, mm. that you cannot serve the flesh and the spirit. One has to be crucified. Right. One has to be put away with, and it has to be killed, and can I say kept killed. Mm -hmm. you got to keep Amen. on killing it. Amen. You know, you got to fight that battle. You never get to put your Christian experience on autopilot. You don't get to sort of coast into the kingdom. You've got to actively fight that battle mm -hmm. every day of your life. Amen. And, and, you know, the Bible says, those who think they stand, take heed lest they fall. So don't ever get to the point where you can say, I have arrived. And I have, and this puts me, you know, your mind goes out and grabs all kinds of things. I'm, I'm thinking about um, uh, First John. Is it First John where he says we ought to know that we have eternal life? Uh, in First, Second, and Third John, or is it is it Second John? Uh, my brain is playing games with me here, but it's 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 the text where he says you ought to know that you have eternal life. Um, so what I'm saying is you, you cannot say once I'm saved, I'm always right, saved. Right. Yet you ought to know that you're walking with God mm. and you're in a state of peace with him. Amen. Because it's, it's important enough for God to want you to know. So the tension is sitting back and saying, well, I got this. I've, I'm, I'm saved. I don't have to work at this. The other was the other side of the coin is knowing that you are walking with the Lord and trusting in God's ability to save you uh, as long as you cooperate with him. Mm. So um, uh, it's, it's hinted at here uh, in, in Romans, uh, but it's stated uh, plainly in John. And that's, that's the tension that we as all Christians have to labor with. For sure. The flesh wants one thing. The spirit wants another. We have to yield to the spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, we are moving along. I guess we've got time looking at the clock on the wall. One more question. This is from Gudrun, 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 and Tony. It does not say where they are from. I do not see. But they have asked a question, which has kind of been in the air, Daniel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's around. You know, you hear it whispered, and you hear people sort of ruminating on it. They asked the question, I have heard it said that the vaccine for COVID-19 is the mark of the beast. Can you enlighten, please? Mm -hmm. um, what say ye? I think it's a very simple answer. It is not the mark of the beast. <laughs> <laughs> for for, for well some said. basic reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we go to the book of Revelation, you know, chapter 13 and chapter 14, yes. uh, where we find the mark of the beast. You know, the mark of the beast it has to do more with a false system of worship. Thank you. And the third angel's message warns us against worshiping the image and receiving the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. The COVID-19 vaccine doesn't have anything to do with worship. Um, so... This does, this does not apply uh, to any particular aspect of Bible prophecy. Um, also, we, we know that uh, the mark of the beast is formed after or is, is, is um, enforced after the image is formed. 
-hmm. And now you have to go and study what the image of the beast is. And we understand that the image of the beast has not been formed yet. Yes. So if the image is not formed, then we cannot have a mark yet. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, mark in, the, in Revelation is contrary to the seal of God, yes. which is the Sabbath. So uh, there will be a false seal that this beast is going to enforce to all the world mm -hmm. to worship uh, in a wrong and a false day, a counterfeit worship mm -hmm. day. That would be the mark of the beast, Sunday, as we understand it as Adventists. Yes. But it, it doesn't have anything to do with the vaccine. Yes, I, so many things come to mind. When you're dealing with the beast, as, as you well know, you're, you're dealing with worship issues. Exactly. In these last days, the, the key issue is going to be worship. Amen. Who are you going to worship? How are you going to worship? When are you going to worship? Why are you worshiping? So when we look at the beast, the beast, the dragon, the devil, um, basically are almost interchangeable. Mm. It's either the devil himself or an agency, religious or secular, that he uses to promote his end. Mm. Um, and, and they all fall under that category. When you look at the, the two beasts in Revelation 13, uh, the land beast, sea beast, when you look at the, the beast uh, in Revelation 14, when you look at uh, the allusions to the beast in Revelation 18, mm -hmm. they are all in the context of worship. Exactly. I don't know how COVID got to the exalted status of, <laughs> of being viewed as, as the beast of the book of Revelation. It's, it's a virus, it's a pestilence uh, alluded to in Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. No more, no less. But there are other vi viruses and other pestilences that will, will, will come in time. But the mark of the beast is something very, very specific. So I will not let this I don't want to say delusion, but it certainly is a distraction. Exactly. Move us away from concentrating on what the beast is doing and who the beast is. And um, uh, so it is not the mark of the beast. Uh, cannot be uh, because the beast is, has a whole different function in our prophetic literature. Our time is slipping away. Dan, you've got a closing thought. Well, um, I think I'll highlight what you said. We should concentrate on more important issues today. Uh, it's good that we ask these questions, mm -hmm. but eventually we need to concentrate more on Jesus Christ, His salvation, His mission yes. for us in these last days. Praise the Lord. Well, our time has fast slipped into eternity. Allow me in closing to wish you both grace and peace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye and God bless.